All right, thank you, Pete. Well, welcome everybody. I hope everybody's staying warm right now. I think most of the state got pretty darn cold last night. Um, there was definitely ice in the puddles on my drive to work, even this far south. So um, today we're going to talk about Beyond the Bob White. Um, and the, the title for this talk is not because I don't like Bob White. I do like Bob White, but we're going to talk about how they relate to other birds on Texas rangelands. Um, why you might want to manage for them and, and how you can do that with these other species because unfortunately a lot of our properties don't have bob whites anymore um, or if you're on a smaller property uh, maybe you have bob white but you're you're part of this bigger matrix and so what you do your management actions are a little bit limited into how they affect bob white um, but they may affect other species too so uh, this first off uh, kind of an overview of where we're going to go today. So we'll talk about um, what species am I talking about? I think most people know what Bob White are. But we'll talk about what I call Bob White neighbors, and, and we'll talk about specifically those species. Then we're going to look at grassland bird populations and rangeland bird populations. Again, this is, um, y'all may be familiar with the fact that Bob White have been declining uh, for several years now. And this is true for a lot of other birds as well. So we'll, we'll talk about that and some of the causes of those population de declines. And then finally, we'll talk about some uh, management strategies. This will actually be kind of the bulk of the talk is uh, what can you do about this on your property? All right, so starting off um, with quail and, and their neighbors. So first off, let's just talk about what quail are and kind of what role they serve in the ecosystem. So first off, they have an, an ecologic role. And there's two terms here that I'm going to use that, that are a little bit technical that I want to make sure everybody's familiar with. The first is that we say that quail are an indicator species. And what that means is wildlife that are indicator species are ones that may be particularly sensitive to certain changes in the environment. And so that's an, an indicator. It tells us as habitat managers, uh, as, as ranchers, as hunters, it, the populations of those species can indicate that a change is happening. And so there's a few different things that uh, Bob White respond to. One is habitat quality. So, um, you know, Bob White we find in good quality habitat. Another is predator density. So that's something that can affect Bob White populations. Uh, we have lots of sayings like um, quail are looking for a place to die or everything eats them, things like that. Um, and, and so they higher densities of predators will certainly affect them pretty quickly. Um, parasite prevalence. This is something we're, you know, looking into more and more. Um, you know, how do parasites affect Bob Whites um, and, and increased numbers of parasites and increased amounts in the body of a quail can affect their populations. Uh, and then presence of toxins. This is something that a lot of times can cause sublethal effects. So you have um, an animal that is being exposed to a toxin and it may not die from it, but it may have reduced uh, reproductive output or reduced functioning. Maybe it, maybe the toxin doesn't kill it, but it inha inhibits its ability to get away from a predator or find food or something like that. So quail can tell us some things about uh, those different uh, aspects of the environment. Quail are also what we call an umbrella species. So not only do they indicate what things might be happening in the environment, but when we take care of our quail, other species will benefit too. So there's some things that are indicator species, but they only occur in a very small area um, or with very specific uh, habitat needs. And so protecting them doesn't necessarily help other things. But generally speaking, uh, if quail are doing well in an area, that habitat also helps out quite a few other species. And there's an economic benefit to quail populations, and this is something that a lot of people may be familiar with, right? Quail hunting uh, can be very profitable, as profitable sometimes as, as grazing leases. The average amount spent per hunter when we consider not just um, lease fees, but also ammo and equipment and you know lodging as they travel to a hunting lease, um, meals bought, um, comes out to over $2,000. So that's a pretty big impact, and especially in our rural economies. So it comes out to total to about $38 billion nationwide. And of course, a good portion of that is coming back to conservation because of the Pittman-Robertson Act that directs funds, um, excise taxes, federal excise taxes from firearms and ammunition back directly back into our state conservation programs. I think it's also important to mention the economic impact of birding. This is a 
recreational activity that is significant and growing. And in fact, we, we know that there's been declines in the number of hunters over the past few decades. There have been increases in the number of birders to where now uh, birders outnumber hunters about 20 to one. And there's some associated uh, economic input from birders as well. They're not going out and um, buying shotguns and they're not buying things that are um, feeding back into those Pittman-Robertson funds, but they are buying binoculars and they're uh, staying in hotels and buying meals and those kinds of things. Um, quail are something that birders want to see. Most birders want to see all species that can occur in an area. So um, they can they can play into that side of things as well. And then that's going to tie us into some of the other species we're going to talk about here in a minute. And then finally, the, there's some, some of the things that quail give us as a benefit, and these other species as well, are not quite so easy to quantify and put a number on, but um, sustainable use of hunting, right? So a well-managed, uh, harvestable population of wildlife is sustainable, right? So we're managing that into the future, and, and that's something that we can continue to do, uh, an activity that you can continue to have. Aesthetic value, meaning that we like to see them, right? And existence value, these kind of tie in together. Um, you know, seeing a Bob White, they're, they're beautiful, they're handsome little critters, and they sound, you know, th their sound is part of what you hear during the spring, right? So we like having those, we like knowing that they exist and knowing that our children will be able to go out and experience them as well. And then finally, a historic value, which simply refers to the fact that they've been in these areas, and so we want to keep them in those areas. They're, they kind of tie us across uh, generations, right? You may have heard of your parents and your grandparents talk about hunting or um, seeing quail, those kinds of things. People know that they've been in an area, even if they're not there anymore. <sighs> All right, so what are some of the quail neighbors that we're going to talk about? Well, for one, we can talk about species that are generalists. Right, so that just simply refers to a species that's adapted to a wide variety of habitats, which may include the habitats where we find quail. But in particular, we're going to talk about grassland or savanna specialists and shrubland specialists. So these are just referring to species of wildlife that um, you find in grasslands and savannas or shrublands, because when we're talking about rangelands and quail, that's kind of uh, what those overlapping uh, general habitat types are. And in particular, I'm going to talk about some species of greatest conservation need. We abbreviate that as SGCN. And these are species that I want to kind of pull everybody's attention to because they are, they've been identified. Um, each state is, is asked to do this from, you know, on a federal level. Each state is asked to identify species of greatest conservation need. Then that includes endangered and threatened species, but it also includes species that are not threatened or endangered yet. And we hope they don't become threatened or endangered, but the idea is that by having this list of species that, that need extra work right now, we can keep them from getting on those threatened and endangered lists. And if we're aware of them and do that work now, that's a little bit easier. Well, it's always easier than trying to recover a population later. So a lot of the species on this list um, have declining populations. So we've shown through population monitoring that their numbers are going down um, or declining habitat. So maybe their populations seem to be okay, but we know that the places that they live have uh, been changing or are not in good condition. And so as a result, we worry about what their populations will look like in the future. So this list, um, don't, don't try to memorize all of this, there won't be a quiz, but um, this is just a list of uh, that I went into the state SGC and list and pulled out um, birds that are savanna specialists, grassland specialists, or, or shrubland specialists. And so in other words, things that overlap with the same kind of habitat as a quail and are on that list. And you can see the, the main thing is just there's a lot of species on this list. And so this is um, kind of statewide. I know we have people attending this webinar from all across the state. So you may not see these species everywhere. Um, but, you know, you see everything on here from prairie chickens to hawks and sparrows and owls, woodpeckers. There's a lot of different species that, that are on this list. And, and so when we talk about the quail umbrella, the habitat for quail helps all of these species as well. All right, so I keep talking about habitat, and a lot of times when we think about habitat, we're thinking about the vegetation that we see on a landscape. But really, to get the whole habitat picture, we're talking about these basic needs of all animals, food, water, shelter, and space. And so I'm going to break these down a little bit to talk about specifically things that quail and other grassland 
birds need um, in, in these different categories? What makes up this whole picture of habitat? So first off, different types of foods. Well, when we're talking about birds, we often think about uh, forbs or, or plants and seeds, right? You know, when you, we think about birds eating seeds because we put out bird feeders and we put seed in the feeders. So we, we think about those things as being important. And they are, especially at certain times of year. So for example, in the winter, um, you know, seeds are a lot of times what's left in an area and there's not a lot of green vegetation now and so that's very important. Well, one of the most important foods for quail and for birds overall is insects. Now, this is something we don't necessarily think about managing, right? Because you can probably go out and identify some of the plants that are in your pasture and uh, on the range and, and you know which ones maybe are good for quail and produce good seeds. But it's also really important to understand that there are insects that are on those plants that are really high in protein and fat and what we call preformed water and that's a valuable resource to quail and other birds. Now because we're talking about not just quail but other species as well uh, we've got to remember that some of those are a little more carnivorous so um, even this bird that's that's on the bottom part of the slide here this is a loggerhead shrike they're considered to be you know a small perching bird a, a passerine but they are um, they're, they're highly carnivorous. <laughs> they're going to eat a lot of um, not just insects, but even mice and lizards. Um, they'll take other birds even. So this kind of just talks about the whole picture of, you know, things that are on the range that can be helpful to different bird species. And, and we'll talk about how to manage uh, these different resources. This is just kind of an intro then. Um, water that we find out on the landscape. It's important to remember, especially in really arid climates, that there are three different types of water that are accessible to our wildlife. First off is free water. And when we're talking about free water, that's what we normally think of as water, right? Well, water that's in a creek or a tank or a water trough or rain or your water bottles. All of those are types of free water. And then we've got other two, two other types that we don't talk about as much. The first of those is preformed, and that refers to water that's contained in uh, other foods, in other things. So, um, for example, I said earlier that insects are high in preformed water. Um, certain seeds have a higher water content than other types of seeds. This is basically like if you eat a piece of fruit versus a bag of potato chips, you know, you get more water associated with, with the fruit. So that's important to remember because, um, as we, especially when we're in a drought, there are resources for our wildlife that are other than free water. Sometimes we'll be pretty short on free water, but if you're managing your habitat well, there can, you can manage so that there's more preformed water on your landscape. And most of our species that are adapted to living in arid places are adapted to using that preformed water, as well as the second type, the, well, the third type on this list, which is metabolic water. Metabolic water is simply produced when your body breaks, or the body of any animal, uh, breaks down a fat or a protein or a carbohydrate. So they break down that molecule and you get energy and um, waste, CO2, um, and then you also get some water out of that reaction. Okay. Everybody go back to high school chemistry with me there for a second. But um, so again, there are species that are, you know, adapted to really taking advantage of that metabolic water and surviving uh, on an arid landscape. All right, shelter uh, is the third component of habitat. And this is what we think of when we're looking around at our, you know, at our plants that are out on the landscape. Um, we know that that's a place that birds can go to. Oftentimes we think about hiding. So escape is really important, especially for our prey species like quail that really have to worry about a lot of different predators. Having a good um, sort of shelter to escape into when a predator is looking for them is important. Um, and we'll talk about what exactly those shelters should look like to, to be best for this. Um, now we also think about, okay, you know, where do birds nest or um, loaf? Where do they rest during the day? Where do they roost? All of those kinds of things. Um, you know, that you think about why does a bird use a tree? Well, it builds a nest there. But the, the second thing actually on this list I think is really important is thermoregulation. And so, you know, on a cold day like today, um, having good shelter and that there's certain ways that we want our plants to look to provide good shelter, um, that's really important to birds. Uh, likewise, on a hot day, right, when you can get in the shade, uh, that's, always, that's always better. And so, we'll, again, we'll talk about these in a little bit. The last concept is space, and I like to spend a little bit of time on this just because um, food and water and shelter are all three things that we can see, and so we can look out on the landscape and, you know, evaluate those, but space is a little bit 
kind of more of a concept to grasp, but it has to do with the arrangement and the connectivity of these other three parts of habitat. So first off, just how are those different things arranged on the landscape? Do we have um, some food and shelter pretty close and accessible for our birds, but water's farther away, um, you know, or, or some other arrangement of those resources? Are they pretty even across the landscape? Now, when we're talking about birds, it's a little bit different than other wildlife. If you've got something small that can't travel very far, these resources need to be pretty close together. So for a quail, uh, because they don't fly very far, you need these resources to be a little bit closer compared to something like a hawk. A hawk is able to fly for long distances, even a little sparrow. They fly a lot more readily than a quail, so these resources can be spread apart a little bit more and they'll still be okay. So again, when we think about managing for quail as an umbrella species, if the resources are close enough together for quail, then they can also be close enough together for some of these other birds. So here's the connectivity piece uh, of this equation, right? Is the different colored circles are uh, each of the different, those different parts of habitat, food, water, and shelter. Um, and then I've used gray lines to show how they may or may not connect to one another. So we think about the connectivity that's kind of naturally occurring on the landscape, but then we also do things that can change that connectivity, right? So again, if you're a sparrow and a road gets built, that's not too big of a deal. Um, of course, there's a risk of, of collision with a car, um, but you know you can fly from one side to the other. For Bob Whites, this becomes a little bit bigger of a deal. And of course, it's different if we're talking about a dirt two track through a property, not so big a deal as opposed to say a four lane highway. So these are things that can affect how these resources are connected. Now, in addition to that arrangement and connectivity, when we're talking about space, the other thing we need to think about with our habitat is how species interact within their same species. So that's intraspecific interactions. So we've got our um, male Bob White on the left who's been kind of going with us through this example. And then on the right now, we have a female. So um, is, is the female on the other side of some kind of barrier if, if there's not good connections in between areas for a species to go find a mate, that's going to be a problem. Then, then our habitat, you know, it might look good in some other aspects as we've got food and water and shelter, but if our males and females uh, need different areas or different resources and they're not able to easily move across those areas, then our habitat might not actually be so good. And then finally, interspecific interactions. So especially with these smaller species that can be prey for other things. Um, you know, if say in this picture, if you only really had one food source and it was right next to a great perch for a hawk, that's going to be a problem. So you have that food, um, but because the hawks figured out that it's a good a good spot to hang out, um, then, then it's not such a good source and your habitat picture isn't really complete. And so we'll talk about this a little bit more here, but um, this is part of the problem that we have with uh, supplemental food sometimes. This is um, one danger of providing supplemental food for bob white or other types of birds is that if you have it in a concentrated area, predators can learn. It's kind of like a vending machine, right? The, this this um, you know feeder that spits out seed for quail, well, they can go there and, and know that they've pretty reliably got a, a meal. All right, so now we've been talking about um, Bob White as an umbrella, but um, part of this being a rangeland seminar, uh, I wanted to talk about what I call, what we could also call the cattle umbrella. And I'm a little bit hesitant to use that term because there's always um, examples of people doing things wrong, right? And so a poorly managed rangeland is not going to be an umbrella for quail or for any other type of species, but a well-managed rangeland um, can be. And so one of the biggest things that has contributed to our quail population declines and population declines of our other grassland songbirds is loss of habitat. So even though quail are pretty small and an individual quail won't move much um, in a given day or even over its lifetime, to survive as a species, they need large contiguous areas of land. And the more that we research this, um, it seems like the bigger that number gets. Uh, if you have 100 acres of the most wonderful quail habitat that anybody's ever seen, but you're surrounded by habitat that's not favorable to quail, then you're not going to be able to support a population there long term. You may have some individuals, um, but eventually if something happens, they're not going to per persist. You need thousands of acres uh, of contiguous area that can support a, a 
a long-term population of quail where you have if something happens in one area that birds can move in from another area and continue to allow that population to persist. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, rangeland bird populations and, and what these look like in Texas and nationwide. So again, y'all are probably aware that our quail populations have struggled. Um, even just naturally in the population of, of quail, there's going to be annual fluctuations. And we kind of see this as a five to six year boom or bust cycle. So this chart um, is data that I took from um, Parks and Wildlife quail surveys. You can find this online. Um, it's publicly available. And I just simply charted it against the time when that data was collected. So you can see again, it goes up and down, up and down. But unfortunately, you can see that our highs are getting lower and our lows are getting lower. And so we get this overall trend towards lower populations. And one thing you often hear when we're talking about what our quail populations look like in a given year is it, when it rains, we'll have quail, and when it don't, we won't. Um, and so if you go back to this graph real quick, you can see some of that boom bust is definitely tied to um, droughts versus rainy years. So if we look, let me grab my pointer real quick. There we go. All right. Um, so if you look at, you know, 2011, 2012, we all know that that was some of our worst drought ever, right? So this little dry spell here, sure enough, quail populations were down. As we get to 2016, 2017, we, you know, we had more of a peak. Now, of course, this is a statewide um, chart. And so you can, at, you can also find on Parks and Wildlife website, you can find um, eco regions. Uh, populations because sometimes you know Panhandle will get more rain than South Texas or vice versa so there's uh, a little bit of variability there but statewide not a good trend and so when we're talking about this um, idea of, of rain and quail what's really important to keep in mind is that this is only true if we have good habitat uh, if we don't have good habitat then it doesn't matter the rain doesn't you know just magically make quail appear so it's important that we manage all the time to create the best habitat we can so that when we have those good rain years and those uh, all those other factors line up to be um, favorable towards quail, then the populations can take advantage of that and respond. And then likewise, when we have droughts and, and bad years, we've done everything we can so that those populations aren't affected quite so heavily. We have a similar story, unfortunately, for grassland birds, again, not just in Texas, but nationwide. So um, these maps are taken from a publication by two professors at Texas a and University, Kingsville. Um, and if you see in that citation down at the bottom, this is a publication's 15 years old now. So it's we've had issues um, for a while with some of this grassland bird habitat, and unfortunately, it's gotten worse. What you're seeing in those different colors on the map, uh, any of the blue colors are positive. That's areas where we um, have increased habitat for that species. Yellow is basically neutral. It's not really increased or decreased or kind of been some of both. And the orange and red is not a good thing. Those are areas where the amount of habitat available for that species has decreased. And uh, red is even more of a, of a decrease of, in terms of habitat loss than the orange. So if you look across these different species, one is, is bob white, right? So if we start, let me grab my pointer again. Um, so we've got scaled quail and bob white right here in our first two maps. And bob white, if you look over most of their range, we've had significant habitat loss. The tiny little bit of increase when we go over to the west, but especially when we look at Texas, most of that has been a net habitat loss. For some species, they've fared a little bit better than others. So chipping sparrow, you can see some increase there, but the red definitely outweighs the blue, and, and that's, that's not good on these maps. Uh, other species like field sparrow, again, you can see in Texas, has certainly been more loss than gain. Black-throated sparrow, lark sparrow, same story. And so like I mentioned, the main cause of these declines has been habitat loss. And um, this is the result of a few different things, but um, land use change can be one of those. So when you see um, a Quail Creek golf course or a Quail Run Road or all these other things that we associate with developments in urban or suburban areas, we do not find quail in urban or suburban areas. Some of our other grassland species um, are a little bit more likely to turn up in backyards, but others not 
not so much. Some of them still need really those open areas. Landscape fragmentation is another problem. So not just areas that have been completely changed, but um, where we have uh, broken up landscapes. Uh, again, especially when we're talking about something like a bob white that needs to move over you know, over contiguous distances because they can't fly very far, that can become a problem. This can also be true for some of our grassland species can fly a lot farther, but not during all life stages, right? So especially when we're talking about um, young birds as they're raising up um, fledglings, they need resources a little bit closer together and more connected. Also, the farther a species has to travel to, to find all those resources, a lot of times the more dangers that it can experience, right? So if we even just think about the way that roads fragment our landscape, you know, every time a bird is crossing a road, if it's flying too low, there's a danger there because of vehicle collisions. So when they have to travel farther, that's they expose themselves to more risk usually. Um, brush encroachment is another thing that has changed our landscape even across our rangelands and I think uh, most everybody on this uh, webinar would probably agree that you uh, you have plenty of brush right this is usually um, the a pretty common problem likewise non-native plant invasion so when I'm talking about brush encroachment I'm talking about things like mesquite um, and juniper that are our native species but because of changes in how the land has been managed, they're becoming more numerous and they're taking over grasslands. When I'm talking about non-native plant invasion, I'm talking about species that are not originally belonging in Texas. Um, uh, we, for example, we might think of um, King Ranch blue stem. That's a huge problem in our grasslands and it's not, not supposed to be here. It's what we call an old world blue stem. So quail and other rangeland birds are compatible with open space. And when we lose that open space, um, we see declines in these species. So something I'm gonna talk about here, just kind of an important concept to carry with us through the, the rest of the presentation is insulation. And the reason that I um, talk about quail insulation uh, or insulation of all of these different species is uh, really thanks to Dr. Dale Rollins, who um, is a wildlife specialist. He's mostly retired now um, with AgriLife Extension, and he's widely known as the quail guy, the quail expert. And he likes to talk about, is it possible to insulate our quail populations? And so I think it's an important concept because we're not trying to, we can't protect our quail from every different thing that's going to happen, right? So shocks to the system are inevitable. That's just part of uh, what we see out on our rangelands. There's going to be droughts some years, floods in other years. Sometimes we'll have fire. Sometimes we'll have disease outbreak. Uh, and stresses on the system are inevitable, right? So shocks, I'm talking about these big events that maybe don't occur you know, all the time. But stresses, I'm talking about these day-to-day -day concerns for, for a, a species, um, trying not to get eaten, trying to find food. Uh, I also should have added on here just disease, you know, that's kind of there continually, you know, not, not necessarily a big outbreak, but they always deal with parasites, for example, to some level. But healthy habitat insulates against shocks and stresses. So when these things do happen, if the habitat is good, the populations can recover more quickly. And the stresses are less severe and less impactful to the population when they have that habitat that they can rely on. All right, so this is the, um, we're going to spend the most time in this third section of the talk uh, about management techniques because I think this is what a lot of people are interested in. What can I do? Obviously, there's a problem. Our bird populations are not looking good. What can I do about that as a landowner or land manager? And first, I want to talk about why we even manage. And if you have been um, ranching or operating a hunting lease for years and years, um, this may be a pretty obvious question. But I like to cover this because for people that are newer to land ownership and land management, sometimes it's, it seems a little bit less clear. Um, Everything I've just talked about, we have population declines due to habitat loss and poor quality habitat. Well, if that's the case, if we've messed things up, wouldn't it be better if we just stopped messing with it? If we just had certain areas that we allowed to just be native and natural and let everything do what it's going to do. And so this is a picture, this is a, an aerial image of the Kerr Wildlife Management Area. And if you look closely, you can kind of see the, the boundary of it. Let me 
grab my pointer again, but um, basically you can see some of these pastures that are outlined here and there's, you know, fencing from within. You can see there's different kind of vegetation types going on um, within that border. And I think this, the Kerr has, uh, there's a lot of good research that's been done there on wildlife management overall, but I also think it has one of the best examples of why we, why we bother to manage. Um, so you can see on this, this is in the hill country, so there's plenty and plenty of cedar, um, but up here in the top, there's some long rectangular plots where different kinds of experiments were done. And as you look through them, these ones on the left look pretty good. These ones on the right, you get to this bottom one here. It's called Plot 9. And the story on Plot 9 is that many, many years ago, um, decades ago, the biologists wanted it to be a control to measure what happens if we don't manage. Now, when it was fenced off, uh, when these plots were created, it was some of the best habitat on the whole management area. And now it is a solid cedar break because nothing has been done there. And so I think it's important to remember, and, and again, some of y'all may already know this, but hopefully this can help you teach others about why we have to manage, um, is because this landscape is adapted to some sort of disturbance. So all, all across Texas, um, we used to have large native grazers, right? Bison used to be found across most of the state on our, on our rangelands and our grasslands. We also used to have periodic fires that would go through these area. Um, and we have changed that, right? So humans have interfered with those processes and we've added roads and we've added towns and all these different sorts of things. And so it's not just able to run like it would. If we could rewind the clock 200 years and then just let everything be, well, then it would be okay. It would run as it was supposed to, um, but it's not like that. And so we have to deal with this as it is. Um, and it's important that we step in and restore as much of these natural processes that used to be here as possible, but they're not just going to be able to happen uh, on their own. And I think another important question to talk about is how do you manage? And again, even if we've been doing this for a while, um, sometimes it's easy to get really caught up in that, that bottom portion, implementing. We think about what we need to do, what we need to do, what do we need to do differently. Um, but there's really a whole process here, and this is part of uh, adaptive management, part of adapting to the changing circumstances that Mother Nature presents us and that happen when the lands around us change hands and different things are being done. So I'm going to go through each of these things um, and talk just a little bit. I, again, implementing is everybody's favorite part to talk about, but I'm going to talk about planning and monitoring too. And in part, I'm going to talk about that because we're not just talking about quail. We're talking about all sorts of grassland species and kind of ecosystem health overall that supports the other activities that we're doing on the landscape. I think the first thing uh, that is important to ask is what are your goals? And this is one of the really neat things about having uh, a land that you manage is that you get to decide that. Is this a property that you mainly want to hunt on? And so you're primarily interested in this talk because you want to have more bobwhite. And so you want to learn more about managing for good bobwhite populations. Or maybe you understand that everything is connected and you really prefer to hunt deer. That's my preference. Um, but you want to look at how to make the habitat healthier overall. And you also want to have good quail and songbird populations in addition to good deer populations. Maybe your goal is ranching. Uh, maybe the land is your livelihood and you've had um, cattle or sheep and goats out there and you want to make that habitat as healthy as possible so that your business can be uh, as successful as possible so that you can provide for your family as well as possible. Um, bird watching is something else I've talked about just a little bit. Some of these um, species, that, some of these songbird species, especially ones that are threatened or endangered or rare, are very attractive to birders who want to come and who might even be willing to pay to come see them. So in April, I'm working with the county agent in Val Verde County to hold a large birding festival where we're going to be bringing people in from actually all across the country. We had some interest from around the world, but I don't think any of those people ended up coming. But we have people coming from as far as New York to come see, paying our landowners to come see some of the species that are on their property. So this is something that can be in addition to some of the other things um, that are being done on the land, right? Most of us don't do just one thing on our property. There's a lot going on. Um, and so bird watching is something else. Um, photography is listed separately. 
because in case you don't know this, bird watching and bird photography are not the same. <laughs> They're very, uh, very different groups of people that are interested in that, and there's a very different approach um, with those two different uh, activities. Um, maybe you're just interested in this for population increase. Maybe you say, okay, if songbird populations are down, I know bobwhite populations are down, I want to reverse that. I know that's not good. Let's, what, let's talk about what we can do to increase those populations. Um, and ecosystem function, again, right, just this understanding that all of this is connected and that if we've got really good healthy grasslands for our cattle to graze, then we're also going to have really good habitat for these other birds but that's important to think about right because sometimes your management is going to be a little bit different depending on what your goals are also as part of planning it's important to learn your property's history uh, i've been really lucky the past couple weeks to work with some landowners as part of what's called texas ecological laboratory and it has to do with wildlife tax valuations um, because these these property owners are allowing us access to their properties to do research and some of those landowners don't get to know the history of their property because they're new to it and they only have the, the information that they were given when they bought it and some of y'all may be in that same situation or some of y'all may be third or fourth generation on the property and so you know the history but learning as much as you can about your property's history is really important um, what has the grazing looked like over the past um, many years? Has brush management been done? Has invasive species control been done? Soil disturbance? All of these things kind of paint a picture as to what is happening on your land and what can be done on your land uh, in the future, whether there's areas that may just need to rest. They may just need nothing for a little while until they've recovered enough that you can do uh, new types of management. This ties into learning your property's characteristics. Um, what are the soil types on your property? If you don't know, there's a really awesome NRCS map that you can look up. I've played with it on our place and you basically draw the boundary of your property and click go and it tells you about the different soil types. Uh, vegetation types, this we already may be a little bit more familiar with, right? You know where there's um, more prickly pear on your land than other places. If you're around the Uvalde area, you may have that one ridge that has a bunch of cenizo because the soil is really thin. And so trying to figure out some of those things will help you think about where your management priorities need to be focused. Uh, topography and weather, again, just all of this, um, learning as much about your land as possible. And, and some of you may already know your land really well, um, but it's a good reminder to get out and learn all the different parts of it when you're trying to manage, especially if you're trying to manage for something new. If bobwhite and grassland songbird management um, is something new for you. All right, Pete, I think that's, is that the first question? Yeah, thanks. All right, so um, real quick, make sure everybody's awake partway through the presentation. Go ahead and um, vote if you, um, oh, is that the right one? Brush. Yeah, everybody go ahead and vote. Awesome. Thanks, Pete. All right. So we've got a couple more of those as we move through. Um, oh, there we go. Yes, that one looks good. Thank you, Pete. Okay. Everybody vote again since we were just talking about management plans. Do you plan to develop a management plan based on what you know about your land? And just as a reminder, these are anonymous. I can't go back and tell on you for your answer. All right. Thanks, everybody. So we'll go through a, a few of those as we go. Um, a question that just came up, will the slides be available for downloading? All of these webinars are recorded and kept on the website, so you can't download the slides themselves, but you can come back through um, and flip through them at any time and, and he, hear me along with it, or I'm sure you can mute and not hear me along with it um, and just kind of look through the different slides. Is, is that right, Pete? Did I miss anything on that? Okay. Oh, the that's correct. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. All right, so um, now that we've gotten the planning out of the way, um, let's talk about what comes next. Let's talk about um, implementation. Again, hopefully by this point you've gotten the message that we're always going to be thinking about habitat. Um, so we're going to take this from food through water, shelter, and space again so that we can uh, think about these implementation uh, activities in that framework. 
The first thing I always like to talk about is supplemental feed. And I think when we talk about making good habitat for any wildlife species, all of us love to talk about food. I think that's because we as people really like food. I made sure to eat lunch before I got on to do this webinar because I wasn't going to wait until uh, after lunch. Hopefully y'all are enjoying something tasty while you're listening right now. Um, and so when we think, okay, what do animals need? We like to think about food and, and what is the best food that we can put out for our different species. Um, but supplemental food can have its benefits, but it can also have its drawbacks. So again, just kind of tying on the example of or building off of the example of quail. Um, I mentioned that you can have a supplemental feeder that some of your predators may key in on and realize that that's a good place to go for them to find a snack. And so if your goal is to help bobwhite populations, but then the predators realize that they can get a, a bobwhite snack um, at the feeder, that's not really so beneficial. So if you're going to provide supplemental feed for quail or for songbirds, this can even mean backyard birds. Uh, I think that when you're providing something like that, there's some responsibility that comes along with it. And the, that really boils down to making sure that when you do this thing, it's actually benefiting the species that you're trying to benefit. So sometimes with quail, the best time to provide supplemental feed, what research has shown to help populations the most, is when we've got really harsh winters. So if you're up in the panhandle right now and y'all just had some snow and you've got some supplemental feed for quail, um, they they might could use it right now because it's a, it's a hard time of year to go out and find some food. Um, the best way to provide that though is not from a feeder, but to scatter it out along the roads, um, drive roads and scatter it so it's not just all in one place. The predators aren't going to be able to come to their um, quail vending machine or, or any other species. This can be a good time to go ahead and put that out, but spread it out so that it's not condensed in one area. Also remember to always be safe when you've got um, supplemental feed of any kind because of things like aflatoxins that can develop. You always want to keep feed um, dry and you know cool, cool and dry. Don't have it out in, in the sun and certainly you don't want it to get wet because it can uh, develop dangerous toxins in it. Food plots are another thing that um, people ask about a lot, and especially if your goal has to do with hunting, uh, developing a food plot may be useful because that's an area where you know that you'll be able to find um, bob white or, you know, or other quail that you might be hunting. One of the challenges with a food plot is that usually if you're going to go through the trouble of planting a food plot, um, if it rains, that's great. Your food plot will be great, but also the rain's going to help everything, so you're going to have good food availability um, across the landscape overall. If it doesn't rain, your food plot's not going to do so well, <laughs> and the rest of the landscape isn't either. So unfortunately, when we really need our food plots is, is when they don't work quite so well. Um, but again, like I said, depending on your goals, that doesn't mean that they're not useful. Now that's kind of from the quail perspective. When we talk about the fact that there's other birds that can also benefit, um, you certainly won't be hunting any of those. Um, near a food plot, but um, having that, that little burst of resources can be beneficial for a variety of species. Question, just as um, could I describe what I mean by food plot? Absolutely. So a food plot is usually an area of land that's planted in some um, particular type of plant that we know is good for quail. This is also done with deer. So for example, um, I might go out and take a quarter acre or so of, of land and plant um, sunflowers there because I know that sunflower seeds are a good resource for quail or doves. You'll see this done a lot with doves. If we're talking about deer, you might do something like clover because it's a very high protein food. So it's just an area that you're planting the plants. You're controlling what goes there as opposed to just managing the plants that are out on the landscape. The other thing that's important to talk about with food, though, if we go back to thinking about um, the different types of food that I was talking about, one of the most important things is insects. And um, insects are not something that you're going to be able to provide or to supplement, um, but they're, thinking about this, this insects and forbs and seeds that are there for our grassland birds, um, how do we increase those? Uh, how do we get there to be more of those for 
um, for our quail and our other grassland species. Um, one of the things that is really useful, I talked about the land is adapted to disturbance. So when we um, you know, think through a, a grassland and the types of plants that we have there, our different plant species go through a succession, meaning that we start with, um, after a disturbance, there's plants that come up early. And these are usually forbs. They show up, um, they're the first things out of the ground, and they sprout. And then by the later on, in the next year, you can start to get more grasses taking over. And then over time, you start to get brush and trees and things that are slower growing, right? So we, we kind of move through this uh, these different types of, of plants. Whenever we can reset succession to those earlier stages, we'll get more of those early species. So our forbs, um, which provide plant material, and then also they are going to grow seeds for um, that are there for the fall and winter, um, those are mostly early succession plants. So if a fire runs through a pasture, your forbs are going to come back first. Um, rotational grazing, so you're grazing in an area, you move those animals elsewhere, um, but they're really heavy in that area for a period of time, the first plants to come back are usually going to be forbs. Um, disking is a, a mechanical process. I think I have a, well actually I think my previous picture. Oop. Sorry, I had to go back a little ways. I didn't plan that very well. This. Um, so this is a, a disking attachment that's being pulled behind um, this tractor. Basically, they're vertical disks that, that disturb the soil. Now we've got to go back to where we were. Okay, um, and all of those are just different ways of disturbing the area so that those plants that are adapted to come up first can come up. Now, not only does resetting succession get you back to those species like forbs that are going to produce uh, a lot of good edible seeds for our birds, but they also can sometimes cause those species to do even better. So, um, you know, you can have a fire go through an area and the species that come back, come back even stronger than if you hadn't had a fire there compared to say just planting them. Uh, they'll be better off after the fire. And native plants are always what we want to encourage for all of these different uh, grassland bird species, especially because insects have been found to be up to 20 times more prevalent on native plants than non-native plants. And so these insects are really, really valuable to quail um, and our other grassland bird species and we'll have more insects if we have more native plants. Uh, all right, Pete, I think we have a question about food. Maybe not. Nope, nope. The one about managing vegetation, actually, it looks like. All right, if everybody will take a second to vote. All right. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, everybody. Uh, so water is our next component here. And we, I already mentioned that um, our birds on rangelands, on our arid rangelands, are adapted to having more water sometimes and less water other times. And, and so that's good that they're adapted to be that. But if you have watering devices, they will almost certainly be used. So using bobwhite as an example, um, bobwhite can survive their entire lives without drinking free water. Uh, and you say, well, I see bobwhite coming into tanks all the time. And that's because water can be helpful. So they can survive without free water if they're meeting those water needs through other methods. But if we're going through a time period that's especially dry and they can't find enough preformed water, for example, through insects and plant material, then they're going to need some free water. Now, there's a couple things to think about when you're adding a water feature to the landscape. Again, we're always going to think about our goals. Who do we want to use this water? Now, this picture um, is, well, it's from Flickr, but it's obviously in somebody's backyard. And, and I put this out because if your goal was to attract songbirds and you get this guy, <laughs> you're, you're a little bit off, right? Or um, we don't control what Mother Nature does. And so uh, it's important to remember that water can be attractive to a wide variety of species, both prey and predators. But when we're talking about a rangeland setting and, and our whole ecosystem health, our hawks are just as important as our sparrows and, and our other songbirds. So um, we may want 
all different kinds of birds to be able to use this water feature. Now, do we want it to be only used by birds or do we also want deer to be able to use it or livestock? All of those things will affect the design. Um, think about the surroundings where this water source is, um, especially with birds. Birds like to get a drink or take a bath and then go sit in a tree so that they can perch there and preen and get their feathers all straightened back out and dried off. So for, for songbirds and perching birds, you don't want to have a water feature just out in the middle of nowhere. You want to locate it, situate it so it's close to a tree so they have a place to preen after taking a bath. Maintenance is important, right? This is something that you're, um, I'm sure you're accustomed to with any sort of water features that you have. Um, and when you're building something for wildlife, building something that's low maintenance uh, will always be useful so that you don't have to worry so much if, if something breaks. But this slide, oh, let's see if I can get it to go. This slide shows uh, a few different ways to provide water on the landscape. So this first image is just a regular tank, right? So we're providing water for livestock and um, we could have deer and, and birds all can use this. Now the disadvantage that this type of tank that's in the top left, I'll grab my my pointer here, um, when we're talking about bird species, is that they can really only perch on the rim of this. So they can't access this for bathing because if they get in, they're not going to be able to get back out. So they can sit on the rim and drink, um, but that's about all. So that's something important to remember of the kind of the limitations of this type of water source. This next um, picture is meant for quail, and so you can see we've got a you know drum with water in it, and then a little uh, trough down in the bottom that birds can come um, and use that water source. So um, this can work well. This one was designed for quail. Um, gets that water up off the ground a little bit. Sometimes that's kind of nice for for birds and to help them to be able to see what's going on around them. And it's certainly small enough to keep other species out. Um, if you have a problem with something like wild pigs, you know, wild pigs aren't going to be able to get in um, and mess this up. I shouldn't say that because pigs can mess up most things that you don't want them to mess up. But hopefully you'll have fewer problems with pigs if you have something like this. Um, this next picture, this is just kind of a close-up, but um, what we call a, a guzzler or a wildlife waterer. And the design on this is you've got this metal roofing on top that can collect rain. This is an ideal way to provide water for wildlife if you live somewhere that's pretty arid, uh, or if you don't have the infrastructure to be pumping water up to places, or you know you don't have a windmill, don't have a way to get water up there. Setting up a rainwater catchment can be very useful for wildlife, so that when you've got that rain, you can fill it up and then have a tank to store it and and use for wildlife later. Some people are lucky to have nice water features on their properties. So this is a Cienega out in uh, West Texas, and it's just been kind of developed and built up. And you can see the vegetation around it is really good to encourage different kinds of, of wildlife to use that. And then this last picture uh, is also out from West Texas at the Chihuahuan Desert Research Institute. This is a pretty fancy um, type of, of bird watering system. It goes every, from this, this area up here where it's pumped, we've got this nice little river flowing down. All wildlife love flowing water and they prefer that to standing water. So this is a nice way if you're going to be, if you know you've got good songbirds on your land and you're thinking about some of those ecotourism things that I mentioned, this is really nice because birds can come use this water and at the same time people can be looking at them in a very beautiful setting um, or if you have photographers that want to take uh, pictures of birds on the setting. All right, question on water, Pete. All right, y'all go ahead and vote. All right, thanks everybody. All right, shelter. So some of these concepts we've already talked about, but if you do have livestock, the best way to maintain shelter for grassland birds, especially because most of those are ground nesting species, they build their nests right on the ground, um, is to graze conservatively. Make sure you're leaving enough grass so that um, we've got good clumps that those species can build their nests in. On shrublands and rangelands, we do have some species that are still going to nest in trees, um, and in some cases they want snags, right? So tall, standing, dead 
trees. And if we don't have those, it may be useful to build nest boxes. And I'll talk about those a little more in just a second. Again, we're always going to take into account our goals and, and existing features that are uh, on our landscape. But looking at these a little bit more carefully, um, quail need their bunch grasses. And this is true, this is useful for all of the different species of birds that nest on the ground. When we talk about a bunch grass, uh, you can see this is an example of a clump of little blue stem. For quail, we need something that's the diameter of a basketball uh, or bigger. So you can see here, compared to a baseball camp, baseball cap, this clump of grass uh, is plenty big to be able to hide a quail nest down in there. Again, I mentioned brush. Um, you may not want mesquite. Um, again, most of us on here probably have way too much mesquite, but some of it is still useful for our species that nest up in brush. Cactus can be useful. Quail and other bird species will nest in cactus. This is an example of a quail nest in a cactus. Um, again, we, it's just not something that we want way too much of. But whatever kind of shelter we have for nesting, the more of it we have, the better. Um, and we'll illustrate this here with these pictures. If you're a raccoon and you love quail eggs, and this is what the landscape looks like, you've got a, two or three clumps of not even grass, but yucca, to look for to see if there's a quail nest there. When you've got a little bit more grass, well, now we've got to do some more searching to find that quail nest that's out in this pasture. And once we start to get like this, well, we've got vegetation all over the place. So if you're an egg predator looking for a snack, you're really going to have to work pretty hard to find it. So having more nest cover, again, grazing conservatively, making sure we save some of those nice clumps of grass is going to be helpful to increase our survival for uh, all kinds of different ground nesting birds. Uh, again, I mentioned thermal cover earlier. Um, in the shade, it can be 15 to 20 degrees cooler than out in the sun. So this is another reason to make sure that you've got uh, clumps of grass and forbs and other things um, to keep your animals cool. Again, this time of year, we're thinking more in terms of shelter from cold, wind, precipitation, having some of those low growing dense species that our birds can hide in uh, is going to be useful. Now, of course, some of our bird species aren't here um, because they can fly. They take advantage of that and they head south for the winter. So they stay nice and warm all the time. But there are species that are going to stay here um, either year round or this is their south, right? They're, they're usually farther north than this. And so uh, having just, a, again, a variety of vegetation is really important for them to, to find the shelter that they need. All right, and then uh, last we've got space um, and having uh, really an interspersion of quality resources is important. If, whatever your landscape looks like, when we talk about quail management, and again, this is true for grassland birds in general, having what we call a crazy quilt can be really helpful to those species. You don't just have a solid break of brush over here and you know grass over there. It's all mixed together, like you can see in this picture and some of the previous pictures I've shown, so that those birds can really reach those different resources all in one area. The last thing I want to touch on with space is mesopredator control, because I talked about space has to do with interspecies interactions as well. Um, predator control is always a big question with quail, and it can apply to songbird management as well. Um, most of the time, the predators that are our biggest impact on our quail and our songbirds are not legal to control because the number one predator of quail um, is accipiter hawks and the Federal Migratory Bird Treaty Act protects those. Um, also, it's just not something that's going to be useful to control. However, when we consider that most our, our quail take their biggest hit to their population when we're talking about nest survival and chick survival, well, what eats a whole lot of eggs? Raccoons, skunks, possums, um, those kinds of animals, what we call meso predators or meso mammals are one of our biggest concerns. So if you have a really high population of raccoons, um, possums, those kinds of animals, you may consider doing limited control during quail nesting season or during the season that these other birds are nesting. You might also keep in mind that the enemy of an enemy can be a friend, right? So if for a long time we worried about um, bobcats and coyotes eating our quail. Well, bobcats and coyotes eat some quail, but they also eat and compete with those uh, nest predators that are even more of a concern. So that's something to just kind of keep in mind when that if that predator question comes up. All right, and then, oh, sorry. Thank you, Pete.
All right, um, and then the last part of this uh, management equation is monitoring. And so this is only one or two slides in here uh, because I could give a whole other presentation on it. And if you're interested, let us know in the evaluations and I can talk far more about how you monitor birds. But you may be familiar with the Texas Quail Index. Um, if not, you can find out more about that through the Natural Resources Institute. Um, but these other things are all talking about managing songbirds. So Nest Watch is where you look at nest boxes. So this one here, we've got a picture of a kestrel in a nest box that was built. Kestrels are one of our grassland species that are in decline. Um, and you monitor, there's a program that you go through to teach you how to monitor the success of the nest that those parents have have built those, those eggs that are laid um, by the adult birds. And that's one way that it's a very straightforward program and there's a very um, clear way to do it that can help you learn if what the populations of birds look like on your property and how those numbers might be changing. Feeder watch is something that can be done in your backyard. I highly encourage you to do it just to start to learn the different kinds of birds that you have on your property. Of course, this isn't going to apply across your, you know, your whole back 40 or, um, you know, 400, 4,000 acres um, because it's, it's not feasible to do over a large area. If you're just starting to learn about birds um, and all these songbirds that I've mentioned are not ones that you've heard of or you're not sure which ones you have, eBird and iNaturalist are two really good tools to help you out. Um, both of those allow you to report species that you've seen. iNaturalist, you take a picture of something and upload it, and if you don't know what it is, there's a lot of helpful people to um, teach you whatever it is that you've seen. And this is for birds and for any other species as well. You can use it for plants. I use it for insects usually. Um, but it's also just kind of helps you document and monitor without going through too much trouble because you probably have your phone with you already. Anyhow, you can download the app um, and then monitor what you're seeing out on your property. Point counts and line transects are a little bit more involved, but especially if you have a particular species, say you know that you have um, kestrels on your property and maybe they've even nested in the past, and so you know where you often find them, doing a point count where you're going out there at a particular time um, and for a particular time, say for 10 minutes, and you know all the different species of birds that you can see and hear, and you do that regularly, that will help you track those populations over time. All right, this is the last survey for y'all, if you'll take a quick second to answer. And I'll have resources at the end to kind of point you to um, more of these. Thanks. All right, and then just monitoring changes on the landscape overall. Um, keep a field journal with you. Make note of which treatments you used, um, when you did them, where on the property that occurred, and then what happened. Um, did it go well? Did it not go so well? Were there challenges in getting it to be successful? And what lessons you learned? One way that's uh, really convenient to do this also is by doing photo points. So at the same point, um, you know, every April, every April 1st or April 2nd, you go out and you use your phone and take a picture. And that can help you see and remember what those changes look like across your landscape over time. The last note here, I'm about to wrap this up um, for the day, is the concept of habitat slack. So different arrangements of resources can work as quality habitat. So sometimes people say, well, how much brush do Bob White need? You might read 20% over here and 50% over there and 60% over there. All of those different things can work. And so what this means is that sometimes management that we do has no effect. And don't let that scare you because that sounds like, well, Dr. Frank, why should I even bother doing anything? What I mean is that it's important to learn your landscape and evaluate what you need to change to have an effect. Because if you have 60% woody cover on your place right now and you think maybe it's too much for Bob White, but even if you put all your resources into it, you're only going to come down to about 40% you're still in that range of what they need. You're not going to be changing that substantially to where that brush makes a big difference. And maybe it'd be better to put those resources into um, partitioning out your pastures or moving your cattle more often so that you can have some of that rotation and that change that disturbance around um, so that you've got taller areas of, of grass for nesting cover for your bobwhite or, or your other grassland 
bird species. Um, so just evaluating again what you have. If you need some help with that, I'd highly encourage you to look up your um, parks and wildlife biologist. Um, if you just go to um, just on your internet, search TPWD, find a wildlife biologist, they can come out and do site visits and help you know what's going to be the first thing you need to do so that your efforts make a difference. Uh, and then finally, I just like to say to note that we care for what we care about. And so regardless of your, your interest in managing for birds, whether that's because you like to hunt bobwhite quail or you like to watch sparrows or whether you're interested in all of this just because you ranch and your family's been ranching and you want this land and this heritage to continue, um, when we're out there on the landscape, then we're going to be able to care for uh, these, these different resources. So I encourage you, uh, hopefully you learned something new today, but continue to learn about those different grassland bird species that are out there. Um, and what can be done to help them. This last slide has resources. If there's any of this that I touched on that you wanted to hear more about, um, feel free to send me an email um, or give me a call. I'm barely in the office this next month, so email is usually the best way to go. And then all these other resources up here, the AgriLife Bookstore has lots of publications on quail management, if that's primarily what you're interested in. Um, and then NestWatch, FeederWatch, eBird, iNaturalist, are all those, those different programs that I mentioned that you can learn more about how to monitor birds on your property. And then finally, All About Birds is done by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and you can type in any species and learn uh, its song, its habitat needs. You can see other species if you're learning to identify how they look different. Um, that's just one that I recommend that you can kind of check out and play around on as you're learning uh, about different species. So um, at this point, if you have questions, don't forget you can type them into the chat box and um, I'll address those so that that gets recorded. Um, other than that, Pete, anything else I'm forgetting? No, you're doing good. Thank you. Uh, appreciate you having me. Very, very interested. And thank you all for coming today. Uh, again, uh, uh, while we wait for you, go ahead and type out your questions. Uh, Dr. Frank will answer your questions. In the meantime, let me say that I'm going to pop out a survey. Please answer the questions. And one more thing is uh, our next session is going to be on March the 5th, Pasture Wheat Management. Dr. Olson is going to be our speaker, and there's going to be one CU uh, IPM attached to it. Uh, if you're not following us, you can follow us on TexasRangeWebinar.tammy.80. It's a website. Or you can also follow us on Facebook, on facebook.com slash txrange. I see a question coming out. We I'll let, I'll let you answer a question while I pop out the link. Yeah, definitely. So um, the question is more information about this topic for wildlife management plans. Um, absolutely. So um, I, if anybody out there is doing um, wildlife tax valuation, it's it's. If you don't know what that is, you if you have your property in agricultural tax valuation, it's it's the same amount, the same tax benefits, um, but you're managing for wildlife instead of livestock or, or ag. It doesn't mean that you can't include ag. In fact, um, as I've mentioned, grazing can be a great part of how we manage the habitat, um, but the focus is different wildlife species. So a lot of people focus on deer or quail or turkey, some of our game species. You can also choose to focus on something like songbirds. Um, and so for more information, again, um, definitely contact your wildlife biologist and they can really help you out um, with some of those different management practices. Um, on the evaluation, go ahead and type in. I think there's a I think there's a place that you can say if there's other things you're interested in. Maybe not, um, but go ahead and shoot me an email um, and I'll pass that information on to um, the, the range, the folks that run this range webinar. Maybe we can do a, a topic on that in the future um, or send me an email if you have specific questions because yeah, this is all of this information can help go into building those wildlife management plans. But your local biologists are great because um, they can be out there and do a site visit and, and help you help you develop that plan.